Let's turn our attention now uh, to the word of the living God. Let's pray and ask for him to help us as we, we seek to read, hear, and believe uh, the word of the living God. Father, we thank you for your, your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you are faithful even when we are faithless. We pray that you will strengthen us according to the power of your might. We pray that you're, you will send to us the gift of your spirit, that we can hear and believe and obey your word. Uh, help us to believe that this is good and profitable for us. Help us to believe that your promises are true, that in Christ we have all of your yes and amen delivered before us. Grant to us the grace to persevere in believing this gospel of your Son. We ask this in Christ's namesake. Amen. Have, you have a seat and turn with me to Judges chapter 13 as we con continue our exposition of the book of Judges. We come to the 13th chapter. We come to the beginning of the Samson narrative, the, the longest narrative of any of the Judges. I was thinking about this text and thinking about kind of the, 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 some of the, the big themes that come out in this text. I've entitled the sermon, When You're Lost and Don't Know It. When You're Lost and don't know it. It was 2019, and I had just attended our a, a pretty intense and controversial General Assembly of our National Association of Churches, and, and after that, Gene and I were making, our, making a drive from Cleveland, Ohio, what should have been about a six-hour drive, down to southern Indiana to visit with some friends and uh, to, have a, to rendezvous with our older two kids for a birthday celebration. And somewhere around Cincinnati... I took on a due south heading and should have been a southwest heading, and I didn't realize it. Now, if you don't know this about me, I have a sense of direction that ranks somewhere up there about where a blind sheep is, my natural sense of direction. And uh, we had become lost and didn't even know it. Unfamiliar countryside, we were actually moving further and further away from our intended destination at every moment, and for an hour, we're bliss, blissfully driving along. Not so much blissfully. We were ignorant and didn't, uh, did not know we were lost. We had a, engaged in some pretty intense conversations, and then finally dawned on me, we're not supposed to be this far into Kentucky. Somehow, we had become lost and didn't even realize it. We find in Judges 13, we find the nation of Israel in a similar place. They are lost and don't even know it. They have purposely, willfully put themselves on a course of idolatry that has taken them further and further and further away from the true and living God. We find Israel, spiritual speaking, in the same sort of trouble. They were lost and didn't know it. They had made themselves lost, and now they provide zero evidence that they even remembered where they were supposed to be going. They had no idea their destination. They don't remember, it appears, what it was even like to be on the right road and going in the correct direction. We, we encounter at the beginning of chapter 13 these very familiar refrains. We, we've seen this cycle throughout the Judges, right? This is, this is the last of the Judges we'll study. We've seen this cycle over and over and over again. What's, and I could probably ask even the young kids here, what's the cycle? Well, the people do evil on the side of the Lord. God hands them over to an enemy. They cry out to the Lord, the God, and God raises up a Savior who delivers them. But one key road sign is missing. We see one road sign that's familiar. We're driving along. We see the familiar road sign, sin and evil on the side of the Lord. That's a familiar sign. We look to our right, we see another sign that God has handed them over to their enemies. God has handed them over to the Philistines. We'll read that. It's, it's for 40 years, they've been under the oppression of the Philistines. But there's one familiar sign we don't see in the text. We don't see them crying out to the Lord. It's just missing. So lost was Israel that they did not even cry out for rescue. So accustomed had they become to the oppression of the Philistines, they didn't even think to ask for directions or ask for help home. The Samson narrative is, is the longest of, of any of the accounts of a single judge. And the narrator seems to give us 
a lot of details about Samson's personal life and all of his various dalliances. But that's not really where the focus is, and particularly on this, in this first chapter of the narrative, we, we have an account of Samson's birth and all the events leading up to that, which you'll see, I think, immediately. There are echoes. There are foreshadowings of a greater Savior who would come, a greater birth that would also be announced in advance, of a child who would become a Savior of his people. I'm going to divide the text under just two headings. The first one is the blind and foolish arrogance or ignorance, arrogance works too, the blind and foolish ignorance of men. So here they are, lost and don't know it, and we encounter the blind and foolish ignorance of men. And secondly, the awesome or fearful nearness of Yahweh. The awesome, fearful nearness of Yahweh. So let's read the text together. Let's read Judges 13 in its entirety and then we'll dive in under those, those two headings. Hear the word of God. Then the sons of Israel again did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh, so that Yahweh gave them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had borne no children. Then the angel of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall be with child and give birth to a son. So now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for behold, you shall be with child and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then... The woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall be with child and give birth to a son, so now you shall not drink wine or strong drink, and you shall not eat any unclean thing, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then... Manoah entreated Yahweh and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you have sent come to us again, that he may instruct us what to do for the boy who is to be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, and she said to him, Behold, The man who came the other day to me has appeared to me. Then Manoah arose and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. So Manoah said, Now your words will come to pass. What shall be the judgment concerning the boy and his work? So the angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, Let the woman be careful. In all that I said, she should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her keep all that I commanded. Then Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, Please, let us delay you so that we may prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, Though you delay me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to Yahweh. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of Yahweh. Then Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, What is your name? so that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of Yahweh said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to Yahweh, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. Indeed, it happened when the flame went up from the altar toward heaven that the angel of Yahweh went up in the flame of the altar And Manoah and his wife saw this, so they fell on their faces to the ground. Now the angel of Yahweh did not appear to Manoah or his wife again. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. So Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If Yahweh had desired to put us to death, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. 
Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up and Yahweh blessed him. And the spirit of Yahweh began to stir him in Mahan and Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's consider in the first place the blind and foolish ignorance of men. Israel was so blind, so accustomed to the oppression of the Philistines, that it didn't even occur to them to cry out to the Lord. Now, there are, I think, at least four pieces of evidence in the text that that Israel had become so complacent with their idolatry, so complacent with their sins, so comfortable in their oppression, that they didn't even think to cry out to the Lord. And I think the first piece of evidence is in the opening refrain. We, and, I, and I mentioned this earlier, what is omitted here is, is significant. Now, I've said this before as we've gone through uh, Judges. We've also seen this in the book of Esther in Sunday school. When we have things that are repeated, particularly in the Hebrew literature, things are repeated for emphasis. And when we have a pattern established, we have a pattern, a pattern, a pattern, and then the pattern breaks. That ought to get our attention. We ought to sit up and say, as you, even as you're reading in your Bibles at home, as you're going through your family devotions, and you're seeing these patterns, and you see something that's not like the rest, you ought to stop and think, why? Why are we being told this? Why is this being omitted here? Once again, look back at verse 1. The sons of Israel, again, did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. We're, we're accustomed to seeing that. Now, something that's significant is that when this phrase is used, there in the Hebrew, it doesn't show up, our, our English Bibles kind of obscure this, but there's a definite article in front of the word evil. Why is that significant? Let me read it that way. Then the sons of Israel again did what was the evil in the sight of the Lord. What was the evil? It wasn't just evil generally. They certainly did plenty of that. What was the evil? It was the whoring after other gods. It was their idolatry. It was the pursuing of, of Baal and Molech and, and all of the gods of their neighbors, the very ones that God had said, avoid them. And again, we have the pattern broken. Yahweh gives them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, we expect at this point, if the pattern holds, to, to read, and the people of Israel cried out to God for deliverance. But we don't see that, do we? So complacent had they become, they didn't even cry out to the Lord. They'd stopped fighting. Now, we might be tempted to think at this point that, well, maybe this is because life under the Philistines just wasn't really that bad. I mean, maybe they were benevolent dictators. Maybe they were the kind of rulers over them that, wasn't, that weren't so tyrannical, that weren't so harsh. But that isn't true. We're going to see throughout about here and even as we get into the life of, of David, as you, as you read further into First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, the Philistines were brutal. They were, they were a thorn in Israel's side. They were one of the nations that God said he left in the land of Canaan to test the people of Israel, to try them, to refine them. So that's the first piece of evidence, is that the cycle is broken here. The people don't even cry out to God. That shows us how complacent and comfortable they had become in their oppression. But there's something else here. We're introduced to Samson's parents, Manoah, a man named Manoah. We're told he's a Danite of the tribe of Dan. Now, the, if you look, maybe you have a, a map in the back of your Bible, perhaps, it shows the 12 tribes of Israel. Dan butts up against the Mediterranean Sea. So we've kind of been working on both sides of the Jordan, sort of skirting that north-south line between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea in the last couple of judges. Now we're moving further to the west, all the way out to the Mediterranean. And we see there the land of Dan. And the sea peoples, the Philistines, had five cities. They weren't a, a, originally a large people, only five cities. But they become a mighty people and a mighty thorn in the side of Israel. Manoah is of the tribe of Dan. Dan, his name means judge. Perhaps even at his birth, his mother names him Dan because he will be a judge of his people, anticipating Samson. Mrs. Manoah is not even given a name. Isn't that striking? We have Manoah, the Danite, and his wife, who's pictured for us as a virtuous woman. She's actually probably the most righteous person we will find in all of the Samson narrative. And yet she's not even given a name. So I'm going to refer to her as Mrs. Manoah. So we'll know who I'm, about who I'm speaking. But Mrs. Manoah, 
misses a, a critical part of the angel's announcement. This is our second clue about the complacency and the, just sort of the acceptance of sin and misery. Notice something very important. In verse 2, when the angel of Yahweh first appears to the woman, to Mrs. Manoah, and he declares to her three vital facts, three vital things that are going to take place. Number one, you're going to have a son. Now, she's told, we're told that she's a barren woman. She's never given birth. And, and, and in any age throughout history, barrenness is, is a, a, a cause of grief. It's a cause of, of exceeding sorrow. But particularly in the ancient Near East, it was, it was particularly so. It was a mark of shame upon a woman not to, not to have given birth to children. And the angel of the Lord appears to her, and it, it seems as if at first that maybe the angel of the Lord is sort of rubbing it in a little bit. Because he says, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children. And she's thinking, well, great, thanks. I already knew that. I didn't need to be reminded of it. But it's, it's, I think it's, it's actually given to us in this way to show us this is not some mere man who has showed up to talk to her. At the very least, he's a prophet who has a word from the Lord that, that knows she's barren. He just sees her in the field and says, Behold, you are barren and have no children. But you shall be with child and give birth to a son. So that's the first thing he tells her. You're going to give birth to a son. Now, ladies, you can, it's not hard to imagine here, I think. You might not hear anything else after this, right? If you're, if you're Mrs. Manoah, and this is the, the source of your constant grief and sorrow. This is kind of, in a sense, what identifies you at your soul level. I have no children. And this angel appears and says, you're going to have a son, and you may not hear anything after that. But notice the second thing he says. He's going to be a Nazarite from the womb. And the book of Numbers gives to us the details of a Nazarite vow. That, that was ordinarily a short-term, temporary vow made to the Lord by a man or a woman. It was a voluntary vow where you did not cut your hair, you did not eat anything unclean, and you had no wine or strong drink for a period of time until you fulfilled the vow. And we see this even the Apostle Paul, the New Testament, uh, at least once takes a Nazarite vow. But here, we're told he's going to be a Nazarite from the womb. This son that the Lord is giving to you will be set apart. He will be marked as holy perpetually, even from the womb. So that's number two. But there's a third thing he says. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. He shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, Look over at verse 6 and 7. Now the woman comes excitedly to tell her husband. Notice she only communicates to him two out of the three things that the angel of the Lord had communicated to her. He says, she comes to him and says, Honey, we're going to have a son. And he's going to be a Nazarite from the womb. But she says nothing to her husband about this son being a savior. I think that's significant. Humanly speaking, we can understand her focus on the first two things only. I mean, humanly speaking, we understand that. And I've already said Mrs. Manoah is very likely the, the, the most righteous person that we're going to see in the entire Samson narrative, and yet she misses the most important thing. She misses the big announcement that God is going to redeem his people, that God is going to raise up a savior. And she doesn't even repeat that to her husband. So that's evidence number piece of evidence number two. If this were a trial, I would say, Your Honor, this is Exhibit B from the, the prosecution or defense. I'm not sure which I'm on. But Mrs. Manoah misses the critical part of the announcement. And I think this indicates the fact that in the mindset of even the most godly, they weren't even thinking about a deliverance. They had forgotten that God is a God who saves. They had forgotten that God is a God who rescues, who delivers, who delights to show mercy to his people. It seems to just, not even part of their thinking, not even part of their consciousness. The third and fourth pieces of evidence I'm going to actually take from the later portions of the Samson narrative, but we'll, they point back here. The third piece of evidence is that in these subsequent chapters, we see a kind of, of coziness of Samson and all the men of Judah with the Philistines. They seem very cordial. 
They seem to do business together. They seem to cooperate together. They seem to, even in their, in their conflicts and, and adversarial relationships, they seem to persevere together in that. And, and it just seems as if the people of Judah had become very comfortable with the Philistines. Chummy, in fact, in some occasions. Just very familiar. They weren't even fighting them. They weren't contending against them. There was no animosity between the godly seed of Judah and their enemy. And fourthly, turn over to chapter 15. There's this scene, and you know this well, it's a vivid display of Samson's cunning and of his, um, the, the sin that remains in him. He burns down the Philistines' fields. He sets fire to them. He puts torches on the tails of foxes and sends them into the standing grain and sets fire to everything. Well, the Philistines, as you can imagine, want, they want a price to be paid. They, they want Samson. They want retribution. And in chapter 15, verse 10, the men of Judah had come and they camped, or the, men of the, the Philistines came and camped in Judah. And so the men of Judah, in verse 10, says, Why have you come up against us? And they said, We have come up to bind Samson in order to do to him as he did to us. Well, okay, that seems reasonable. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Ittim and said to Samson, Do you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? Do you see what they do? They are comfortable with this. They've said, you've, you've got to submit to these guys. They are rulers over us. You have to submit to them. See, to me, the men of Judah sound like the sort of leaders who would quote Romans 13 at this point and say, we have to submit to the civil authorities, even though they're asking us to do something ungodly. We, we, even though they're saying you have to shut down your churches and you can't worship together and meet, you have to submit to them because they rule over you. Do you see? This was the kind of comfort. You're probably already smelling where I'm going with some of this. The men of Judah had become very comfortable with the Philistines ruling over them. So, just to, to recount, in the opening narrative, we have no outcry from the people of God. Mrs. Manoah fails to mention the most important part of the prophecy from the angel, that there will be a savior come. The men of Judah, along with Samson, are really chummy and familiar and comfortable with the Philistines. And when push comes to shove, the men of Judah tell Samson, you've got to submit to these guys. They're our rulers. They were formally acknowledging that the Philistines had a right to rule them. Now, as the Samson narrative opens, we, we find a sad state of affairs. We are familiar now with this sin, or this cycle of sin and idolatry. And that's, and we see them cry out to the Lord to raise up a deliverer, but we don't find that here. We don't find that among the people. The people are pictured to us as blind and foolish, ignorant of their own lostness, ignorant of their own condition. We find here instead a complete lack of concern among God's covenant people for their own souls. We find a lack of concern for their need to be delivered, for their need to be rescued. It's almost as if they had forgotten that God is a rescuing God, that God is a saving God, that God is a deliverer by his nature. There's a pastor named Mez McConnell. I heard an interview with him years ago. He has a book called Church in Hard Places, and he, he's a pastor of a church in Edinburgh, Scotland. He ministers in what they call the schemes of Scotland. That sounds to us like it's a kind of a negative word. A Scottish scheme is what we might call a housing project. It's government housing. So it's low income. It's, it's infested with drugs and prostitution and, and gambling and crime of all kinds. Pastor Mez serves at a church there that ministers primarily in these Scottish schemes. And in this interview I heard, and I'm not quoting from directly because I couldn't find the quote. I'm, I'm recalling what I heard. But when he talks, he said, to pastors in, in Europe or pastors in the U.S., and, and those pastors say to him things like, wow, it must be really difficult pastoring where you do because of all the hardship and human misery that you encounter. And he said, I respond to them kind of like this. I said, no, it's actually much easier where I am. The people where I serve know they're lost. The people where I serve know their misery. The people that you serve in their affluence 
And in their comfort, they're the ones who don't know they're lost. They're the ones who have the hardest time embracing the gospel because they won't embrace their lostness. Well, that's really kind of where Israel is. Israel has been maybe fat and happy under Philistine rule. Maybe the Philistines have allowed them to maintain a sense of of some measure of material prosperity, so they haven't hurt that much. They haven't cried out to the Lord. And I, and I pray that, that the spiritual conditions that, that in Israel surrounding the birth of Samson will cause us to think and, and to meditate upon these things, to think deeply about the nature of lostness, about the complacency which surrounds lostness, about being comfortable in sin, being complacent in sin. And I want to invite us to, to, to meditate upon this by application on four different levels. Number one, let's think about the application with respect to the lost people who live near us, all around us, the lost people with whom you work, the lost people in your neighborhoods, in the marketplace, the ones that you do business with, perhaps the ones that you'll have Thanksgiving with here coming up soon. How how do we pray for them? Do we we recognize, are we self-conscious in our thinking that they don't even realize how lost they are? Maybe perhaps in, in their comfort, in their affluence, in their relative health. They've got friends and family and a nice house and a job and all those kinds of things. And there's been some hardship. I mean, things are kind of tightening up in our economy, but overall, things are going well. How does this affect our pattern of praying for such people? They're lost and they don't know. They don't even have the sense to cry out. How how does this help us think with a biblical understanding of the desperation of those who are lost? So let's meditate upon that as as, as a first sort of layer of application. But secondly, let's look, let's take our our lens out broader. In in, in the the broader evangelical church, where where there is a, a, a comfortable, complacent disposition towards holiness. Where there's a, a, a the prosperous person who's blind to the oppression of indwelling sin, who may in fact be a believer, a genuine blood bought child of God, but is not being confronted with the scriptures, not being confronted with the holiness of God, and 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 the peril and the threat of sin that remains in them. How do we pray? How do we think about lostness in those situations? How do we think about those who've become complacent? Maybe with with what Jerry Bridges calls those acceptable sins. But on a third level, let's also think about not the application out there, but the level of, of a local church, and particularly this one. How do we think about our own complacency with respect to the to the ordinary means of grace, the gathering of the Lord people in the Lord's day? of our exhortation to one another, our spurring one another on to love and good works, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Do we hunger for the holiness of God at GFBC Conroe? Do do we yearn to draw near to him in righteousness? Are Are we crying out to him out of a sense of our lostness apart from him? Do we, do we, are we cultivating with one another a, a great sense of our need? Or is it kind of the dominant part of our, our psyche, the dominant part of our, of our thinking that says, we're, we're good, we got this? I mean, we'll, we'll throw some prayers up every now and then because we know we need some help. I mean, we're not working completely without a net, but God is really just our net in case something goes wrong. Let's take this even closer to home. Let's think about you. Where have you grown complacent and comfortable with sin? Where have you just shrugged and said, you know, everybody struggles with this. This is normal. This is ordinary. It's not that bad. I mean, I haven't at least done that thing over there or this other thing. I haven't done that. Where have you become complacent? Where have you stopped crying out to God? Say, Lord, will you rescue me? Will you deliver me? Where have you just become comfortable with the oppression of sin that remains? 
Have you forgotten the promise of the Word of God? In Romans 6, the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul says, For death, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves, consider yourselves, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you forgotten that? And you say, well, sin's just a part of me. It just, it just is. Or do you fight? Do you cry out to God? Or have you become cozy with the sin that remains? Have you given up the fight against sin in general? Or, or have you given up the fight against just a particular sin? Have you, have you thrown up your spiritual hands and said, hey, nobody's perfect. The free grace of, of, of Christ is mine, so this little sin here is not that big of a deal. We must never forget the blind and foolish ignorance of men. And we must never forget that blindness and foolishness still remains in each one of us. Amen? There's a blindness that remains. There's, a, there's an ignorance that remains. There's a foolishness that remains, which all the more we need to submit ourselves to the means of grace where God exposes these things to us. See, that's the, that's the thing. We can become very comfortable because we set aside the word of God. We set aside his ordinances. We can blissfully sail on because there's no signs to warn us. We're not being confronted. The Spirit of God is not grabbing us by the lapels and saying, listen to this. Hear this. And we've neglected the fellowship of God's people in which other brothers and sisters are saying, hey, did you hear that? Brother, how are you doing with these things? Sister, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord? Are we, are we spurring one another on in those ways? Or are we kind of co-conspirators in our mutual complacency? Encouraging each other not to want love and good works, but to forgetfulness and ignorance. In what ways are we encouraging one another? Praise be to God that, God, that, that Yahweh did not leave his people here. See here, they didn't even cry out. They didn't even know they were lost, and yet God didn't stand by passively and watch. God intervenes at precisely that point. Praise be to God that even though his people fail to cry out, he draws near to them. He, he had already provided for their rescue, and he makes himself known so that they know who he is and who he has appointed to deliver them. So let's consider this as the second point, the awesome nearness of Yahweh. The awesome, fearful nearness of Yahweh. See, the truly amazing part of the story is not Manoah. It's not Mrs. Manoah. It's not even Samson. The, 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 the focal point of the story is the activity of Yahweh. The things that Yahweh has done from eternity to prepare just this moment. What we discover in these scenes with Manoah and, and Mrs. Manoah and the angel of the Lord is that this heavenly messenger is no mere prophet. In fact, he's not even merely an angel. He's referred to as the angel of the Lord, but we can tell by the way that the people respond here in the text that he's not a created being. He is not only an angel. That would be fearful enough, but far more than that, this is God himself that draws near to them. What we discover along with Mr. and Mrs. Manoah is that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh. The second person of the Trinity, the Word, the eternal Word of God appearing to them in visible form. And we see this first of all in, back in verse 11 when Manoah has prayed and asked Yahweh, can, can you send the messenger again? It's, you almost sense that Manoah is kind of thinking, I need to hear this myself, not because I don't believe my wife, but I, I need to hear this myself because I, 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 he understands the duty to raise this child as a Nazarite, to, to raise him separate in a particular way. He wants further instruction. And so then Manoah arose, he follows his wife. Because when the angel comes the second time, he comes to Mrs. Manoah again, and just so happens she's out in the field, her husband's not with her yet again, so she, she jumps up, runs, gets her husband, he comes back, and Manoah arose, followed his wife, and when he came to the man, to the angel, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? Look at his answer. I am. 
Now that should immediately remind you of something. This is the answer that the Lord gave to Moses out of the burning bush. Another time when the second person of the Trinity appeared in visible form and spoke to a man. And Moses said, if I go and tell the people that God's going to deliver them, they're going to ask me, who sent you? What name should I give them? And the Lord said, I am that I am. Not I was, not I am becoming, not I will be, I am. The eternal one has sent you. But secondly, in verse 18, when, when there's this, this exchange between Manoah and the angel of the Lord, and in verse 17, Manoah says to the angel, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of Yahweh said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? This word is used only one other time in the Old Testament. It's used in Psalm 139 where David is contemplating the the incomprehensibility of God. And he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. This idea of wonderful means incomprehensible, unimaginable, unknowable. This isn't creaturely language. This is not the language that, that any man would use of a creature, even an angelic one. The angel says, my name is beyond your understanding. You can't even fathom my name, much less who I am, my nature, my my majesty, my glory. My name is far above your ability to understand me. Then, as we look down further in verse 20, 20 to 22, Manoah goes and he prepares this young goat, Those of you who've processed animals or wild game, you know this was not a short errand where Manoah says to the angel, hold on just a minute, I'm going to go prepare a goat and a meal. This is going to take some time. And the angel says, I'll wait, but I'm not going to eat your food. If you want to offer this as a burnt offering, do that to Yahweh. So that's what Manoah proceeds to do. He comes back and offers this up as a burnt offering. The flame goes up from the altar toward heaven that the angel of Yahweh went up in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife saw this. So they fell on their faces to the ground. Now the angel of Yahweh did not appear to Manoah or his wife again. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. See, do you see the, the something indescribable here? Here's this man who apparently looked as if he was an ordinary man. There was nothing remarkable about his appearance. He wasn't glowing. He he didn't appear in glory. He appeared as an ordinary man. And yet, by his actions and by his words, Manoah came to know this is God himself. Look at verse 22. Manoah turns and says to his wife, We will surely die, for we have seen God. This points us ahead to another man who would come, whose appearance didn't wow anyone. Who was as common and ordinary as they come in terms of what he looked like. But by his words and by his deeds, people came came to know that he is the son of the living God. We have here in the angel of the Lord, no mere man, no mere angel, but Yahweh himself. This event is, is, is awesome in, in the truest and fullest sense of that word. We use that word a lot and overuse it, I think. But this truly is an awesome scene. Mr. and Mrs. Manoah were, were visited by the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity. The eternal word was made visible. He appeared to them. And, and theologians refer to this as a Christophany. There's a word theophany, which is kind of a general uh, Theo, meaning God, and and phani, meaning appearance. It's an appearance of God. Here at Christophany is the appearance of the second person of the Trinity in visible form to a human being. We have a few appearances like this in the Old Testament. In Genesis 18, I, I mentioned where God appears to Abraham in the burning bush. Or actually, in, in Genesis 18, it's where God appears to Abraham and to Sarah along with two angels. Then in Exodus chapter 3, the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush. Then in Daniel chapter 3, we see a dramatic appearance again 
where the pagan king looks into the fiery furnace heated up seven times its normal temperature and he sees these three young men who should have been instantly consumed walking inside the furnace with the fourth man with them who is like the son of a god. It's the second person of the Trinity in human form walking before them. So let us not miss the significance of of the event that, that takes place here in Judges chapter 13. Note the absolute mercy and kindness of the Lord that he would appear to an obscure, childless, nameless woman. We live in an age where, thanks to critical theory, we like to try to look at these different deficiencies and, and, and uh, weaknesses. And here, she's checking all the boxes. She's childless. She doesn't even have a name. Well, she has one. We're not told what it is. She's a, no one knows who she is outside of her husband. She's obscure. She's a woman in the ancient Near East. And God appears to her. He makes, his na- he makes his, his self known, his presence known to her. Men, I think there's a lesson here for us as well. This is not the main point. This is, this is a bonus lesson. When the angel of the Lord appears a second time to Mrs. Manoah, and she jumps up and goes and gets her husband, notice how quickly he follows his wife. Notice how quickly he runs after her. Matthew Henry makes this observation. He says, to atone, as it were, for the first fatal miscarriage when Eve earnestly pressed Adam to that which was evil, and he too hastily yielded to her, let yoke fellows excite one another to love and good works. And if the wife will lead, let not the husband think it any disparagement to him to follow her in that which is virtuous and praiseworthy. Ladies, don't don't get a, a warped view of submission in your mind to think that there are no ways in which you lead your husband in godliness. No ways that you encourage him in righteousness. No ways that you stir up his holy affections. Surely, Mrs. Manoah did this here with her husband, and we ought to commend her for it. We ought to commend Manoah for being willing to humble himself and follow after his wife on this this occasion. And it did no violence to his overall leadership. Again, that's a bonus. This event in Judges 13 is is, is really not about Samson. It's really not about his, his parents, even. The passage is about the nature and the character of God. Notice here the mercy of God that he draws near, and not draws near to such a woman as this. And we see both the nearness of God, or what we would call his imminence, but we also see his transcendence. We see both of them side by side. And that's why I've called this the fearful or terrible or awesome nearness of God. At one and the same time, God is wonderful. He is incomprehensible. He is most holy, most righteous, most powerful. He cannot be governed by men, and at the same time, he draws near to men. He draws close to men. God is at one time both near and yet far above mankind and his creation. And this should provoke us, I think, to repent of the low view of God that Israel had adopted and perhaps we may be tempted to adopt an excessive familiarity, a a sense of casual approach to God. Israel had had begun to think of Yahweh like the false gods of the neighbors that they worshipped, or the false gods that they worshipped of their neighbors, I should say. And I read in our call to worship Psalm 115, but it bears repeating part of this. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Listen to this. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. See, that's one of the themes that we've seen run through this, run through the book of Judges. When when we worship and serve idols, what happens to us? We become like them. We begin to think like them. We become like what we worship. Israel had given themselves so much to the worship of idols that, number one, they forgot Yahweh. They forgot that he was a delivering, rescuing, redeeming God. 
They forgot his holiness, his majesty, his dominion, and his glory. But they also began to think that God is like these other gods that they serve, a God who can be manipulated, a God who needs them, a God who is only exists to serve them. And may the Spirit of God help us to marvel at the awesome nature. See, Manoah was correct. Manoah's instinct was correct. Honey, we're going to die. We have seen God. Because Manoah understood in that moment, even though it wasn't the initial physical appearance, but by his words and by his actions, Manoah discerned this, was, this is God. And we've stood in his presence. We've seen him face to face. We're going to die. Manoah had a sense of what worship of God must truly be. But at the same time, we ought to marvel at the nearness of God and the gracious appearing of God to men. The Lord came down and made his will known that he was going to raise up a Savior for his people. They didn't deserve this. They didn't cry out for it. They didn't ask for it. And yet, they had actually utterly despised God's gracious dealings with them. Not only had they not cried out to God, they continued to go the opposite direction, willfully. The Spirit of God declares to us in Romans 5, Saints, hear this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. See, God sent another Savior, a better Savior, a complete Savior, in the days to come. Not because we cried out, not because Israel cried out, but because God in His mercy saw their misery and raised up a Savior. Saints, do you understand this? When you were dead in your sins, languishing under the, the wrath of God, comfortable in it, in fact, justly condemned, and yet completely unaware, completely blind, completely ignorant to the danger that surrounded you, when you were ignorant of God's holiness, you were, you were blind to His goodness, you were a self-sufficient, self-righteous rebel, and that's when God worked secretly, but decisively, savingly, behind the scenes to ransom you, to deliver you, to call you to himself. When you were lost and didn't even know it, God drew near to you. And, and, and perhaps you've seen that pattern repeat over and over again in your life, haven't you? I know I have. Certainly at the time of our conversion, the time when he justified us by faith and by his Spirit's power gave us new life, caused us to be born again, but there are other times in our growth and sanctification that suddenly God makes us aware of a pattern of sin in us that we formerly didn't even see. And God in his mercy comes and shows that, shows us our blindness, shows us our ignorance, and shows us his son. He says it's in him that you have deliverance. At the right time, God sent his own son born of a woman, born under the law, to save the very rebels who did not even have the sense to cry out for rescue. Uh, frankly, I don't know how you can study a passage like Judges 13 and come away an Arminian. I just don't. I, I'm, I'm, anybody can help me with that, I'm open to it. I just I don't see it. Matthew Henry again, he says, for Samson is a type of Jesus, a savior who saves his people from their sins, but with this difference. Samson did not only begin to deliver Israel, David was afterward raised up to complete the destruction of the Philistines. But our Lord Jesus is both Samson and David too, both the author and the finisher of our faith. I love that. May the Spirit of Christ be pleased to help us this afternoon as we seek to avoid two, two opposite errors. And we see this, I think, sort of side by side with Mr. and Mrs. Manoah. We need to understand both the response of Manoah and his wife and put them together in order to get this right. On the one hand, we can think too little of God's holiness and become too comfortable with his nearness to us. We can come in the presence of God and fail to tremble. Fail to be struck with awe as we come into the presence of God. But on the other hand, 
we can fail to be comforted in the presence of God. We, we can fail to draw near to Him in peace. Dale Davis says, Christians sometimes have a tendency to read passages like this with their condescending, silent commentary. Well, of course, Manoah was only an Old Testament believer and he didn't understand. Oh, on the contrary, he says, Manoah understood perfectly and he trembled. We must allow Manoah to be our teacher. We must not poo-poo his reaction as understandably naive. Manoah may have been wrong in his inference, but he was right in his instinct. For where did we ever get the idea that the presence of God is not dangerous? Where do we ever get the idea that the presence of God is not dangerous? Have we really bought Santa Claus theology? Has God somehow become safe because we live in A.D.? Is God too safe for you, saints? Have you lost a fear of God as you come into his presence? Is it too common, too familiar, too ordinary? See, at the same time, we, we need Mrs. Manoah here, though. We need her response to blend together. Not, not to either or, not to balance things out, but to blend the two together. We need Mrs. Manoah's response also. Look at verse 23. Manoah had just said, we're going to die. We've seen God. And Manoah, Mrs. Manoah says, if Yahweh had desired to put us to death, he would not have accepted a burnt offering from us. He, he, wouldn't, have offer, he wouldn't have shown us these things. He would not have allowed us to hear these things if he had meant us harm. Saints, do you think this way as you gather before the triune God each and every Lord's day? See, Mrs. Manoah saw with eyes of faith that God intended good for them and not harm. Do you see how we need both perspectives here? We, we need both perspectives. We, we can have a reverence of God and lack the comfort of a son. We can, we can lack the reverence of, we can have a reverence of God and come before him Forgetting that Romans 8, 1 is true of us, there is now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We come under the heavy burden of our own sin, and we feel the condemnation of our God that he has taken away. We have a sense of his holiness, we have a reverence and an awe of him, and we forget that he's invited us to come as sons and daughters. But on the other hand, we can, we can fear him, we can lack the childlike joy of knowing we are loved and cherished, but on the other hand, we, we can take the nearness of our God for granted. Tr trading the holiness of an awe-inspiring God, and we trade that for cheap grace and casual familiarity. We need to meditate upon the awesome, fearful, terrible nearness of God and hold them both together. That as we come into his presence, we come with a sense of, of, of awe, a sense of reverence, a sense of his holiness. And yet we come assured of the confidence that he has hold out, held out the golden scepter to us. As we've studied in Esther, the symbolism there, the king, the almighty king, the ancient of days, has extended to us the golden scepter and bid us to touch the sun, to kiss the sun and live. Psalm 2. Verse 11, I think, captures this balance perfectly. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. I love that. Rejoice with trembling. That's the balance. That's the attitude of the saint who comes before the Lord, aware of his holiness, his majesty, his dignity, his glory, his thrice holy nature, and at the same time has a sense of, of, the, of joy at the grace received, the assurance of pardon, that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. For those here today who, who do not know Christ, young people, hear me. By nature, you are blind and ignorant and comfortable with your sin. We're all born into that condition. Will you, will you search the scriptures? Will you hear the word of God and, and, and hear on, on the authority of God's word? Don't trust your own judgment. Don't trust your own thinking. Be self-suspicious at all times. 
Hear the word of God. It says you are lost and you are perishing. God is holy and just. And He will not just overlook your guilt. He will not simply turn a blind eye to your sin. Do not think that your father's faith, that your mother's faith, covers you. This is not an umbrella insurance policy. You must own it for your own. You must come before Christ on your own and say, I see the terrible holiness of my God, the God whom I've offended, but I also behold the Savior in whom I can find mercy. I believe the promise that he will will save everyone who calls upon him. That by his all-sufficient, perfect merit, having lived the perfect, sinless life, that all of that credit, all of that goodness can be yours by faith. And that all of your sin, all of your guilt, is washed away in his blood. Will you believe that? Will you believe both of those are true? This narrative that gives to us this behind-the-scenes account of, of the birth of Samson immediately should point us to another birth in the future where the announcement of a child, a child named Emmanuel, God with us, would be announced. From eternity, God had planned this other birth. The Son of God would come far more than a Nazarite was he separated from birth. The Nazarite vow was, was primarily external. Jesus Christ would come perfect, sinless, from the womb. Everything that we are not, you and I, sinful, from the womb, from conception. Christ, from conception, sinless, perfect, set apart for holy use for God. Samson was merely the foreshadow of the Savior who would come. Jesus is that Savior who did not merely begin to save Israel but completed it. It was promised to return and save us to the uttermost. I have in my notes, and I'll commend it to your own study. Go back and look at Acts chapter 17. Paul dealing with the philosophers at Athens on Mars Hill. And look, what, look carefully what Paul says about God. They were blind and ignorant men. In fact, so ignorant they had a statue commemorating the unknown God. Didn't even know his name. They had a sense it was someone that they forgot to worship. And Paul comes and says, I can tell you exactly who this God is. It's a God who's been patient. He has persevered with men's ignorance. He is a God who is near. And yet he is a God who is terrible and awesome. And he will judge men, all mankind, according to the perfect standard of one man. Go home and read that, beginning in verse 24. Read through the Acts 17 and see how the things that we see in, in Judges chapter 3 regarding the nature of God, this, this terrible, awesome nearness of God are true in what Paul testifies to these pagans at Mars Hill. But I invite you to ponder in your hearts today and to take, take this away with you as you meditate upon the Word of God. From Judges 13, will you meditate upon the blind and foolish ignorance of men? For those who are lost and don't even know it, will you meditate upon that? Meditate upon the, 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 the ignorance and the blindness that remains in you. And meditate upon how that ought to drive you to pray for others around you. And also meditate upon the awesome, fearful nearness of Yahweh. And how we, we come into his presence with that sense of raw awe and reverence and fear and we rejoice with trembling. We come thankful that we are able to enter into his presence as sons, as daughters, assured of pardon, rejoicing in the promise that one day, even the sin that remains in us will be undone. That the return of Christ, and we're caught up with him into the heavens, and we're given a new body, that even the sin that remains now will not remain then. The sin that so easily ensnares us now will have no opportunity then. We will be able to enjoy a a, a pure and unencumbered fellowship 
with this thrice holy God with unhindered joy and yet still with trembling for all of eternity because he is a holy, holy, holy God. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for the mercy that you've shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that as the golden scepter is extended through the heralding of your word today, that you would be pleased to invite those who are outside of Christ, those who have not yet bowed the knee to him, to come in and touch the scepter, to kiss the sun and live. Father, will you stir up in us a sense of wonder at your incomprehensibility. Help us to meditate upon that which our mind cannot even conceive. No mind has been able to conceive the plans that you have in store for your people. We pray that you will bless us, that you will comfort us, that you will give us an assurance of your promises that you will convict us of sin that remains and convince us that you are able to save through Christ your Son to the uttermost. It's in him that we ask these things. Amen.